Good afternoon, and welcome to this session on strategic infrastructure investment. This is a key time for the world, an extraordinary time that we all live in. And one of the, the areas that isn't getting a lot of focus right now is what happens to the infrastructure investment agenda. It's universally recognized that um, infrastructure investment is good for, for world growth, but is it still going to get attention with all the conflicting demands that we have to deal with now with this 100-year um, event of COVID? I have a very good panel today to, of people involved in several different parts of the infrastructure world, from telecoms to, to um, renewables and beyond. And I'd like to introduce them to you now, and um, we've got 45 minutes to uh, explore um, what the issues are and um, how, how bad the effect's going to be and what can be done in terms of um, different approaches, different mechanisms. So I'm joined by Cedric Brusselman, founder and CEO of uh, Eurasia. Vitaly Vanselboom, of, uh, Chief Executive of S3i, Jürgen Reinhardt, Chief Executive of SMA Solar Technology, Michael Wilson, Board Director of Send Power Holdings, uh, Ben Crawford, CEO of Central Nick, and um, Simon Galpin. Senior Invest uh, Advisor for the Investment Promotion of the Bahrain Economic Development Board. Welcome. Um, Vitaly, would you like to open in terms of um, explaining what the United Nations is doing in this space and what is your overview of, of, of how bad a, um, a, a problem we have, um, not with COVID generally, of course, but with with the knock-on effects to infrastructure. Thank you, Andrea. I think I figured out why I earned this punishment. It's because I'm paid up member of uh, Daily Telegraph. But don't tell anybody. Um, I'm not sure I can speak on behalf of um, the entire United Nations. Um, different entities and agencies of the UN system um, are involved in uh, activities that touch on what we call financing for development. And you know, UN generally tries to facilitate and streamline and catalyze and you know, bring different parties together. But uh, what UNOPS and in particular its new outfit uh, S3I or Sustainable Infrastructure Impact Investments attempts to do is a little bit different in that uh, we go all the way into the deals, not uh, around the deals. We help structure them. Uh, we build on the trust and credibility that we enjoy, uh, working uh, all the way from uh, grassroots people, you know, uh, civil society circles, and all the way up to uh, uh, the members of government and, uh, you know, number one people in the countries where we operate, such as uh, president or prime minister. Uh, so bringing those parties uh, to the table uh, is something that UN generally does. Um, given our so-called convenient power. Uh, but what was missing uh, up to now is our ability um, to share uh, in the risk-taking and, uh, you know, being able to uh, take equity or debt positions directly from our balance sheet and uh, being able also to speak the language of both private and public sector. And this is what uh, UNOPS in general and SRI in particular would like to do. Uh, we started this process about um, a year ago in earnest. Uh, I moved on to this uh, new assignment some six months ago, uh, literally one week before the complete lockdown. So interesting times. Um, I think we had some successes uh, and we operate in three um, fields. Um, in no special order, affordable housing, uh, renewable energy and health infrastructure or private hospitals to be more precise. I will not go into explaining now exactly how those deals work, um, but the idea is that um, we bring uh, governments to the table in terms of facilitating um, different uh, deals uh, that we source. Uh, for instance, when it comes to affordable housing, they would provide land, they would offer uh, favorable 
uh, governance and taxation and other conditions. Um, UNOPS would bring its um, uh, operational capability. Uh, we do project management for a living. We know how to run things on time and within budget. Uh, we can also uh, provide some seed funding. Um, not a lot of money, but you know, a few million here, maybe a, a few tens of million there. And then uh, the most important part is um, we introduce uh, strategic institutional investors to the deal that will come with uh, already hundreds of millions, millions and uh, billions and tens of billions of dollars that we need. Uh, in affordable housing, our pipeline right now is about $45 billion and uh, quickly growing. Uh, so I believe we are doing something very useful, uh, but we are not saying that others should do the same. Uh, this is just the way we look at things. Um, and we are very interested in, breathing, in uh, bringing other players to that proverbial table. Uh, very briefly, in terms of uh, COVID-19, um, maybe somewhat counterintuitively, uh, the pandemic has actually been somewhat helpful to us uh, in that um, governments at the highest level, they realize that even though we're experiencing massive difficulties right now because of lockdowns and uh, um, enormous pressure on, on health authorities, um, at the same time, uh, once the economies start reopening, uh, the best thing that the governments can do for themselves is uh, make investments in infrastructure because it's really, you know, history tells us it's the best way to create new jobs and spur local economic growth. And uh, when we build those homes or hospitals or create uh, power plants, uh, all the industries uh, that are somewhat related uh, to those sectors will directly benefit. They will hire more people uh, and, uh, you know, they will share the benefits uh, of that economic revival. So this is what we're trying to facilitate. And with your permission, I'll stop here for now. Thank you. That's very interesting. Thank you for that overview. Um, Cedric, would you like to um, take up the mantle now and talk a bit about what strategic infrastructure investment means for you and your company? Okay, thank you. Um, I will take a more, probably more entrepreneurial uh, view here, uh, maybe to give you first some context where I'm looking at is uh, from which uh, vantage point. Uh, so I'm a, a serial entrepreneur and um, Eurosia is a company I founded and we are active in uh, building information modeling and city information modeling. So in short, um, we replicate uh, through digital twins buildings, infrastructure, cities, uh, transport infrastructure, etc. Um, so uh, basically we have re known a, a very strong growth. Uh, we've been also recently acquired by a, a large multinational, NG. And um, um, the question around COVID is um, actually it's, it's twofold. On one hand, uh, what we see is that the the, the COVID itself for business of digitalization of infrastructure is uh, actually quite positive news because people managing those infrastructure, uh, uh, funding those infrastructure, infrastructure, see that they need more digitalization. But what we see on the ground now is basically that um, uh, from a business perspective that uh, decisions in terms of investments of uh, new infrastructure or refit and so on are being postponed. Um, um, so that may be uh, a sign. Uh, so building on the point um, of uh, Vitaly, indeed, um, uh, government and, and public institutions uh, would need to step in uh, a big time. Uh, the, the little worry I, I may have is twofold. On one hand, is um, we've seen before a couple of years back after 2008 announcement around infrastructure investments and so on. Uh, in Europe, for instance, where at the end, the investments were kind of clubbing previous investments that were that were already in, in the plans, but basically renaming them uh, uh, for, for certain parts. On the other hand, uh, COVID-19, yeah, maybe the crisis of the century, but it's the, the tree, probably the tree hiding the forest of, uh, you know, another topic like climate change. 
where government would step in, hopefully to reinvest in infrastructure. That's the what. What is key is the how. So how it's going to spend uh, the money. So respending money on, for instance, we talked about power plants, uh, coal or whatever. I mean, it's not going to solve the real, the real issue uh, that, that is behind COVID. COVID is just a, a, a symptom uh, of uh, what's, what's going to happen. Um, yeah, so that's my, those are my two cents and I'm happy to, um, to jump in uh, later on in the, in the panel. Thank you. How, how is it affecting the renewable sector, um, particularly with a, the other um, dates not moving in terms of what we need to do to meet all the deadlines for um, renewable targets? Uh, um, Jürgen, would you like to um, talk, talk a bit about that? Yeah, I can do that. Um, so good day to everybody. Um, yeah, to just set the stage at the beginning, what what is actually um, happening in the renewable sector, and especially if I look from the fact of the um, of the solar industry, then we do see quite some changes over the last years. So actually, I think it's not so widely known that the um, solar energy has become the cheapest form of electricity production, so much cheaper than coal, um, even nuclear or, or wind. In, in most cases, actually, um, down to under two cent per kilowatt hour um, production costs. And um, that has, of course, spurred the wave of um, big installment rates. And, and we are looking forward to 2030 and 2050 that probably most of our electricity will come from, from photovoltaics in, in at least in, in 2050. Um, and that actually brings together very interesting factors. The, the first one is, of course, it leads to decarbonization. That's, that's logic and clear. The second D would be then definitely, um, uh, definitely decentralization um, because of the fact that if you have a, a rooftop application, then you are a prosumer, you are consuming and producing electricity. Um, and also big power plants are actually normally nearby the application, be it a mine or um, a city if um if anyhow possible and um the third one then comes from the fact um that of course if you have a decentral system with intelligence in it then digitalization is is very very um near to hand so um in a home you definitely have uh, digitalization in the form that you can do energy management you can charge your electric vehicle cleverly with artificial intelligence with apps that you program of when you want to have it available etc you can have your white goods um, washed when there is sun um, available and all of that can be done automatically. The same is true in a supermarket where you might have electric vehicles outside that you want to fill up. You want to um, handle your heating, ventilation, air conditioning demands. Um, and all of that can be done with uh, clever ener energy management systems. So. In end effect, it brings together the three Ds of, of decarbonization, decentralization, and especially de digitalization. And um, with being the, the cheapest form of electricity nowadays, I think it's a very, very good um, means of um, working against climate change on the one hand, while at the other hand, especially also getting people into work, um, getting people in rural areas with access to electricity and digitalization. Um, because of the fact that you then also um, can work from home, etc. And, and um, out of that reason, back to your questions, we did not have so much effect from, from COVID as well. So the total market for photovoltaics this year will roughly be 100 gigawatt, um, which is roughly 100 big power stations, just for, for, um, for understanding. Um, new installed power, and that's uh, the yearly amount right now. In 2030, it will be roughly 300 gigawatts, so three times the effect, uh, the, the power um, produced per year or, or introduced new per year. And um, this growth is coming. And, and uh, even throughout the pandemic, we've had um, reductions, of course, in, in certain countries. But um, I think from next year on, we will see 10 to 20 percent um, growth rates again in the inst installation of uh, renewables and and this will probably continue uh, uh, for the next 20 30 years uh, as i would think 
of course, hopefully together with uh, wind and other forms of uh, regenerative energy, and of course, together with uh, storage, because solar is obviously not available at night in the different regions. So um, this all goes hand in hand, and especially power to gas, as well as um, electromobility will spur new development of uh, regenerative um, development because of the fact then that you have much more need for electricity uh, for the electric vehicle or for making green hydrogen. Thank you. Uh, telecoms um, communications has been one of the big investment infrastructure areas over recent decades. Um, ben, would you like to um, tell us a little bit about how, how that might be changing? Ben, you're on mute. Uh, yeah, I think you might need to unmute. Well, th thank you for uh, correcting that. Uh, so I was saying the, um, the the nations of the world have have uh, planned and created massively co-funded national broadband plans, country by country around the world, uh, to provide the infrastructure for the internet to their populations through fixed line and wireless and satellite. And uh, some nations came quite early to this, like Hong Kong. They, they introduced their policy back in 1998. But uh, but the big impetus for this this uh, came in, in in many countries in the world out on the back of the of the subprime crisis. And so you'll see many of these policies date from 2010. And so on the one hand, addressing um, uh, 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 priming the economy and creating jobs, and on the other hand, creating a new infrastructure that that hadn't existed before, um, in order to move the population forward uh, into the digital age. And and obviously, these programs have in the past and continue in the future to be uh, funded by government, by grants, by tax breaks, um, created. Uh, often by telcos that have governments as shareholders. Um, so these information communication technologies have really come to the forefront, obviously, during the COVID-19 outbreak with the lockdowns, meaning that um, much in the way of business and education uh, relied on these infrastructures suddenly. And that crisis, therefore, has also drawn attention to the disparities uh, between nations and within nations between those, the digital divide, those that have uh, uh, easy access to the internet and those that do not. And, um, and, and whilst obviously that, that divide is very clear in, in the emerging world and we were, and remembering that only half of the world's population today actually has access to the internet or uses it, uh, such disparities also exist in, 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 in some of the, the, the wealthiest countries in the world as well. And um, uh, uh, there, there's a, certainly a coalition of forces to try and remedy this from, from the United Nations um, Sustainable Development Goals around the, exactly these issues, which um, uh, for those of you uh, who are watching at the time, uh, Mark Zuckerberg actually addressed the General Assembly when the when the um, when the Sustainable Development Goals were announced, uh, trying to bring this internet access uh, uh, issue to to the forefront, and um, and and he's continued to lead on this. But companies like Google and obviously the telcos of the world, the, the handset manufacturers and so on, have all played a role. So so we can't understate the. Um, the role of private enterprise as well, but government has certainly picked up the bill for uh, for a lot of this infrastructure. Uh, I think today the issue is that this needs to continue, but there also needs to be a um, an ecosystem built around this infrastructure of such things as education and encouragement of, of policy that encourages entrepreneurship, continuing to bring in um, uh, uh, bring in the private sector as well. And, and this is really crucial because the uh, at the moment 
without these additional things that can turn this digital infrastructure into a platform and a foundation for a true digital economy with producers as well as consumers. Uh, when we have that, and that's certainly the area that my company is, is, is very involved with, Central Nick, is assisting government and private enterprise and, and even small businesses with being able to make use of this infrastructure to build new things, to build an, an internet economy. Uh, without that, all we have is consumption. And so the only real benefits there are people can update their Facebook pages. That's it for me for now. You're on mute now, Andrew. Sorry about that. Um, thank you. Um, we also have Simon with us, who is also heavily involved in the digital um, economy. How how do you uh, see? Would you agree with Ben in terms of how 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 it's been affected right now? Yeah, I mean, uh, for us at Bahrain's Economic Development Board, we have two main roles. One is to lead the charge in helping to diversify the, the economy of Bahrain away from oil and gas and into more digital type sectors, but also to actually attract and support uh, investors that want to come into Bahrain. And so to do that, you know, just being a zero tax economy, an open economy isn't enough. We need to have the right infrastructure to really attract the right types of investors. Um, across the GCC, there is around 1.2 trillion US dollars of infrastructure projects underway at the moment. Here on the island of Bahrain, we've got a slightly more modest figure. We're just investing 32 billion US dollars in a range of infrastructure projects. Um, and what we've seen with the arrival of COVID is that while some of the projects, the tourism-related projects, have been slightly delayed, the projects that are going to help us to become a digital economy have actually been uh, accelerated. So we have Amazon Web Services opening their first major data region for the Middle East in Bahrain. We have 5G. But we're looking also at the soft infrastructure, having the right regulations, having a, a cloud-first policy and so on that will really encourage uh, businesses from the digital space to come into this uh, into this island. Thank you. Well, last but not least, um, we have Michael, who um, is a serial entrepreneur specialising in infrastructure development, trade facilitation involved in constructing maritime ports, oil and gas terminals, power sector, and ICT platforms and global trade facilitation. Um, obviously, the um, construction industry was very heavily affected um, by lockdowns. How do you see the infrastructure environment um, being affected by the changing priorities? Um, uh, Andrew, uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I think that we need to be very realistic on the realities on the ground. Um, now I've been locked down in Ghana for the past six months and negotiating um, an oil and gas uh, port with the government, with investments from uh, Saudi Arabia. And, and you can see really that firstly, the, the breakdown in uh, global multilateralism is, has a direct effect on our own discussions. I, I think that um, we must state figures, you know, from Anctad, uh, 26.8 billion, a trillion dollars lost in terms of GDP, 100 billion lost in Africa. And yet we are all saying that governments with reduced physical space must come to help, as it were, prop up um, infrastructure investment. Where is the money going to come from for, for government uh, to do so? This is something that um, we need to think about. In the 
transport sector in particular. Okay, we've seen even in April 2020, um, according to the World Investment Report, a 50% drop. And in the oil and gas sector, it is 80% drop in terms of investment. So the delays that, um, you know, Ben uh, has mentioned and the organ as well, these delays are a reflection of the uncertainties that are, are, are before us. And I think um, clearly it would be very useful for the UN uh, or parts of the UN to pick itself up a bit more. They are the only institution that can use its convenient power to bring us around the table and have an open and frank discussion on the way the world is going and may perhaps realign um, the monies that are still available for investment, you know, more towards the SDGs. So that's my brief introduction. Thank you. That's a fantastic uh, summary. Thank you so much in terms of the, the and it really makes it quite daunting to look at the situation. I, I want to go around again and um, look at two things. Um, one is um, leadership, uh, which you, you just um, referred to at the end of your of what you were saying just now. Who who are we looking to for leadership in this in this um, if, if we can call it an infrastructure crisis? Um, who who do we look for to provide that leadership? Given that so many of the world's nations are affected and and so many are under great strain with other um, health and um, governance issues. And secondly, if you could narrow it down to one or maybe two things what would you suggest in terms of remedies or ways forward are there um, new mechanisms needed or um, new avenues of funding new approaches just a different management style or is there a new need for a different level of consensus and um, um, joint operating um, coordination cooperation to um, kickstart the investment which we all know is necessary but is looking under threat from from the situation that we have um i wonder if we could all um address that you can have more than one if you if you if you want to not um restrict it to one vitaly can we can we start with you again in terms of um, i know you're you're not um, a great supporter of um sort of different models and um uh, as, as, as such, but in terms of, is it fair for people to look to the UN for leadership, and and what would be your your one or two um, single actions or acts which you think could help? Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, I don't think I can offer you a particularly straightforward answer. Um, I think people can look at the UN for leadership, uh, but I think in many instances there will be. Uh, seriously disappointed because UN is well positioned to do some things, but not many other. Um, and when it comes to leadership, it's not um, just one particular layer of society where all those leaders reside. Uh, they, they may come from so many different walks of life. Um, I think uh, governments have to show more leadership. Uh, we very much understand the political cycle. Uh, they operate from one election cycle to another. And uh, in our experience, when we talk to senior government leaders uh, less than six months before the election, it's uh, much easier to make a deal. Uh, whereas just after they won, uh, it's so much harder. Uh, so it, it, it takes uh, individuals and processes that are genuinely interested in making progress. And it's not just about electoral promises. Uh, same with uh, companies. Um, there are so many, literally thousands of uh, entities, uh, companies, firms, conglomerates uh, that uh, learn how to pay lip service to sustainable development goals and, uh, you know, show how much they, um, they want uh, SDGs to succeed and what they're doing. Uh, but it's nearly impossible to take many of them out of their comfort zone 
and they try to act as mini UN, which is come to different events, shake hands, uh, you know, photo ops, uh, but very little action beyond that. Uh, so some serious leadership coming from the private sector is also needed. And then uh, what works very well in many instances is when, um, you know, unusual leaders emerge. You know, there were some unappointed leaders in, uh, in uh, infrastructure in general, in climate change, sort of uh, activists that uh, appointed themselves leaders, and some of them did much better than others. Uh, so it, it takes action in all of those circles, and then they have to be sort of juxtaposed in a very positive way. And that's the only way, uh, you know, to gain some momentum and uh, try to bring things to successful closure. Uh, but it is true that UN can play a very useful role in many ways, and uh, we're trying. I mean, for us, this event uh, this morning was opened by the UN Secretary General, uh, who we know is genuinely committed um, to these goals. Uh, same with uh, Deputy Secretary General coming from Nigeria. Uh, she's the uh, champion, designated champion of uh, financing for development. They're trying to do what they can, and there are so many other leaders in uh, different countries around the world that uh, are trying to help all of us succeed. Uh, but in terms of uh, models, it's not that I'm averse to that in general, uh, but based on our experience, we understand that, you know, you cannot come with just one model and make it work everywhere. And that's, that's literally impossible. We need lots of mini models. Some would work well for sub regions, some for one individual country or even one province or state within a country. We have to be very open um, to those changes, embrace those changes, because if we force certain models on unsuspecting populations and governments, that will definitely not help us succeed. Uh, so, for instance, on housing, we now operate primarily in eight locations. And uh, high level, you can say we are pursuing a similar model, but the way we go about business is very different in all of those places. And I'd be happy to explain that, but certainly not uh, not in the next couple of minutes. Maybe we postpone that until better times. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I should say also to everybody who's tuning in that um, we will welcome your questions. Um, I think there's a mechanism on the site to to ask ask any questions you want, and I can ask the floor to respond. Um, Ms. Cedric, would you? Um, like to address this um, issue of leadership and also um, are there one or two particular things that you think would make a big difference that um, would be almost like easy easy wins? Okay. Um, so when we talk about leadership, I'm, um, I'm a bit smiling. I don't want to be cynical, but that's potentially the point is that uh, we wonder whether there is any leadership. Um, so the... the what I was saying before, uh, maybe I, I can make myself a bit clearer, is that to me we are in an economy at war. Uh, and it's not a, a war among, among people, which is good, but it's a, a war, I mean, the clock is ticking. Uh, again, COVID is just a symptom of what is lying ahead in terms of uh, what is waiting for us in terms of climate change, biodiversity, etc. But this is um, a topic that is potentially addressed in other panels and that uh, we could spend a whole day on that. Um, so if th the real framework here, and I think it's an opportunity, is to reset uh, the system. And um, I think you mentioned there, there are uh, de facto leaders who have a five-year or whatever mandate, COVID is fine for them because it goes into their mandate. The thing is that the real crisis here that we have is climate change that doesn't fall into a mandate. It's a 10 to, to 20 years uh, effort. So that's kind of the, 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 rather the frame or the helicopter view that I would like to take and the strategic um, the, the investment in infrastructure uh, should come into that picture, not the way around. And uh, to me, um, first, the word infrastructure is pretty broad. So the first thing is to define what our infrastructure, which one we are, we, we, we are targeting, and um, put priorities, okay? 
So if the society project, and which is a, a global society project that can be the same, I mean, overall, I guess we all want to live on a livable planet and that our children and grandchildren can live on something that, a planet where we have left something that is uh, livable and that's something that we share across cultures, across uh, people. And I mean, if we are, that, 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 that's, that's a given. Then we put priorities, right? Uh, priorities, I mean, in, in Europe versus in, uh, in uh, Africa or whatever, as, as, uh, as um, Vitaly mentioned before, we don't want to push and force whatever. I mean, each country, each people know exact, know pretty well what they need. I mean, it, there is no supranational having a bank or whatever having to say, okay, this is what you need. No. Uh, uh, locally, people know what they need. But what we need in general is a framework of priority. So climate change and this kind of issue, what do we want? I mean, how do we want to prioritize? We know that energy is on the top of the agenda, probably. Which type of energy? Uh, we, I mean, we talk about renewables with, uh, with Jürgen. We know that's, that's, uh, that's a way to go. Uh, I mean, we're not going to get into the nuclear uh, uh, discussion, but uh, uh, we also know that we will have a transition and that going for gas uh, may not be the great solution <laughs> while waiting for renewables to be at, uh, at a cruise speed. Um, so I know I'm not answering the question. <laughs> I, I, maybe I could be a politician too. Uh, but my point here is that uh, basically, in terms of infrastructure, if we go back to that, it needs to be taken in an overall uh, framework of priority, which is the root cause, which is climate change. COVID is a symptom of it. And let's let's focus on what we need to focus on, which is really, I mean, uh, the future of our planet. And um, and in terms of, of um, priorities, uh, and leadership infrastructure, we, we just need to first say, okay, so what are we aiming at first, um, uh, second, and third? That's, again, my, my two cents. And that's very stimulating. Um, and Jürgen, I imagine that somebody in the renewable sector, you would, um, you would agree. I mean, do you think that this is such an important issue that it needs to be prioritised investment in infrastructure um, relating to climate change just needs to be given priority above most other things? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what is important to, to realise, and, and I'm not going to repeat everything Vitali and, and, and Cedric have said already, um, but I fully agree on those issues that it's it, there's not a, a single body we can point out to either the UN or um, um, the government as a general who can take the leadership. I do believe when it comes to climate change and infrastructure projects in climate change, it needs to boil down to governments. It needs to be driven by the governments. And of course, for that, we also need to have people, first of all, who accept the facts from the, from the scientists. And that is not everywhere the case, as we know. Um, then really um, define the plans per country or even per region, as Vitali said and um, go into investments for that, um, really taking into account that uh, due to the decentral effect of um, renewables, it's possible to really do um, decentralized islands, microgrids, and, and really foster a digitalization in microgrids that j did not even have um, a power supply prior to that. So, I would say the the order of leadership would be governments uh, and, and correct leaders. Second would actually be, and Vitaly mentioned that, um, I think the youth should not be underestimated. Um, Fridays for Futures and, and others do have a quite big influence actually on the governments. And um, so the public as such, but especially also the the, uh, the voice of the youth will be having an influence and, and therefore I'm always very happy if, if, if they voice that interest. Um, thirdly, of course, companies, I don't want to sit as a company and say, uh, we need to get it served. Of course, we shall do our part. And um, I said that earlier in the preparation, I mean, I'm, I'm, I grew up and I was born in, in Namibia and in Africa, and um, I've always had a big heart to try to 
um, get projects done there. Mainly, unfortunately, they have been on smaller scale where we made smaller schools, etc. And um, there, I think, then programs from the UN, etc., could come in to really say there's a, a um, there's a sack of money that we can use um, for um, projects in Africa or in rural areas of Southern America, India, to to really foster um, infrastructure when it comes to electricity and thereby also foster um, possibility to work from home in the rural area in a digitalized way. Um, so I think it's it's boiling back to everybody, to, to governments, to public, um, to um, companies, as well as to, of course, bodies like the UN to, to try to harmonize that less in Europe, but more in um, in Africa or in India or in parts of Southern America than in, in Central Europe or, or cent, um, Northern America or Japan. Thank you. So in, um, I mean, communications, Ben, what, what is the um, priority, do you think, for infrastructure investment to, to, to um, unblock some of these um, blockages? Uh, well, well, I think in this area we certainly have seen some leadership from from government. Um, if you think, for instance, of um, the Irish government's um, Innovation 2020 initiative, which uh, is dedicated to um, encouraging the private sector to dedicate uh, uh, resources to uh, to research and development with the target of two and a half percent of the gross national product and similarly in Singapore with their um, uh, research innovation enterprise plan which is investing uh, 14 billion dollars in scientific and technological research uh, and, and 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 other governments around the world that are doing the same and and in fact, uh, creating a, a, a political environment in which being a digital champion is actually um, uh, uh, perceived as, on the one hand, being visionary and thinking long term, but on the other hand, uh, perhaps galvanizing some of the support of youth and so on, as, as has been mentioned. I, th I think um, then, then moving away from government to the private sector, I, I, I think... Uh, Whilst um, Michael makes some very good points about the the the, the pain felt in, in terms of the impact on GDP from COVID, uh, part part of the effects of that I, that that I've perceived have been a very significant reallocation of investment, uh, simply because uh, people still need have money to invest and still need a return, and if whole sectors of the economy suddenly are no longer offering that. They're really shopping around, uh, um, trying to find where to invest and, uh, which, which potentially could benefit many of the, the causes that have been discussed today. And, and I would lastly say that anyone like, like I'm sure a lot of ourselves are involved with organizations like Harassus and World Economic Forum and even things like the Bloomberg uh, CEO Forum, the, 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 I have never seen so much focus on climate change, on social equality, on um, longer-term future goals, on digitization as, as there is this year. And it does seem that there has been a... In other words, I believe that the corporate sector in some areas is stepping in where certainly in some countries we might feel that the governments are, uh, don't have their priorities right. Uh, I, I think, uh, there's, there's many in the corporate sector that are now filling that, that gap and, uh, and actually taking a leadership role. Thank you. I hope we're not going to run out of time. I don't know. They're not going to cut us off. We've got um, two speakers left. So, um, um, Simon, from the um, for, from your perspective, what would you like to add? Well, you know, I think um, one of the advantages of being a small economy is that the central leadership of Bahrain can get all the major decision makers in one room and push things through very, very quickly. 
whether it's putting in place the right regulatory environment to allow these uh, these infrastructure projects to, to, to take off or to track the projects. So tracking our second causeway connecting Bahrain to Saudi Arabia, tracking our new light rail project and so on are, are all very, very important. Um, but I also think there's a there's a leadership role from, from the bottom up, and that's the startup ecosystem that we're seeing. You know, there's a lot of innovation coming in there in terms of fintech, in terms of uh, startups that can also contribute to the infrastructure spend. And although in the GCC region in the, in the past, most of the investment has come from the governments, in the future, that can no longer be the case with the, with the oil price the way it is. We're going to have to leverage on private sector investment much more in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Michael, I think we've still got a little bit of air time. Yeah, okay. And you so eloquently um, outlined all the all the problems um, earlier. I guess it's too much to ask you to solve them all. <laughs> but uh, is there anything you'd, uh, you'd like to pinpoint? Uh, so very briefly, I think that in terms of um, leadership, I think how do we define it? You know, what platforms should we create? I think we should encourage, you know, public-private uh, discussions public people discussions and private people discussions, you know, P, 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 you know, four times P. And I think that this kind of blend will bring about the true feelings that will lead to the realignment of these investments. And finally, I should say that perhaps again, the UN can help us because there's a multitude, uh, um, there's a huge number of initiatives, you know, Choose Africa by the French government, Prosper Africa by the, by the U.S., SDG 500, I mean, we just heard of Irish 2020, there are social bonds of $50 billion, there are equity bonds, so many post-COVID initiatives. And I think if we bring them together, we should be able to realign them. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Well, we got through it. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm sorry I had to cut you all short. Um, I'm sure we will have, carry on this debate at this event and at others. Um, it's left to me to just thank everybody for taking part and thank you, everybody who's joined joined us today. And uh, enjoy the event and have a good day. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.